Hey guys, how are you doing today? It's P.E. Gilbert, your blogger, writing consultant, and the author to the fantasy novella, The Sultan's Daughter. And today, we are honoured to have an interview with the writer, video content creator, and YouTuber, Andrew Bluett, who has recently created the original web series, Real Life. Andrew is deeply passionate about video creation, focused, and very knowledgeable. Here is the interview. Enjoy. What was the spark that made you decide to become a video content creator rather than in another medium? So the spark, I would say, was when, when YouTube was still young. This was 2006, 2007-ish. Um, and I had gotten into uh, the video game series Kingdom Hearts in junior high school. And I saw people making music videos out of the cutscenes from the game. Well, the games, there were still, there was more than one still at the time. And I was like, wow, I want to do that. So I downloaded the cutscenes uh, from some fan websites and I started editing together to make my own music videos, AMVs, uh, which people still make a lot of those for a bunch of anime and stuff, but they've gotten much more elaborate. Uh, I don't watch it anymore. That's not the content I consume. But I did make it for a time, and I started thinking about uh, doing other stuff. And that's also when I was getting into uh, the game series Halo. And when Halo 2 was a thing, more people were making short uh, animations made with Halo 2 uh, called Machinima. It's a portmanteau of machine cinema, basically animation that is produced in using real-time graphics, like uh, obviously a video game engine. And Rooster Teeth, uh, had been making the sh series Red vs. Blue. They'd been doing it in partnership with Microsoft, who owns Halo. Uh, they really inspired me in part to make a Halo machinima. I, I knew that when I got the equipment that I wanted to do that, and things just kind of snowballed from there. Film and television, what draws me to that, to those mediums, is the blend of visual and aural uh, cues and storytelling and the use of the camera to give you an insight into how a, someone is feeling or a, a power dynamic between individuals and oral cues can really change the tone of a scene. You can add sound effects to make it more of a comedy. You can add tension. Uh, whereas in say prose, uh, obviously you have to think a lot more, a lot more about your descriptions to set the tone. So it, it's the visual and aural cues uh, with TV and film that really drew me to uh, this sort of medium. Which three filmmakers do you look up to the most and why? Uh, first, I would say Brad Bird, uh, who directed The Iron Giant, uh, as well as The Incredibles, which I revisited earlier this year for the first time in quite a while. With Brad Bird's style of storytelling, his aesthetics, you know, he goes for the fantastical in terms of aesthetic, but in terms of tone and storytelling and character, it's all very grounded. You know, the Iron Giant has this 50 to 80 foot tall uh, robot from space, but the story is all about uh, teaching him right from wrong in this era of Cold War, Cold War paranoia. Then, well, and also Brad Bird is one of the earlier uh, artists and directors on The Simpsons and I'm a lifelong Simpsons fan. So that that is a big thing. That is a big up in his favor. Uh, second, Stanley Kubrick. I do not agree with the man's methods. The way that he treated Shelley Duvall uh, filming The Shining is absolutely monstrous. The man was a perfectionist to a fault, and I, I do mean a fault because he was a horrendous taskmaster, and he was taskmaster. He was able to get away with it because he made art. Kubrick understood how to use the camera to tell a story. He would use the long takes. He would no, he would go for these long form stories, but even, even though it felt like padding, it set the expectation and tone for the audience. It's like, oh, when are we gonna get to such and such? It's like, you feel tired. And then thirdly, uh, Edgar Wright. Uh, I, I, I have a great appreciation for Edgar Wright. 
uh, be mainly because of timing, is efficiency of time and editing to create comedy dr and drama and to establish a tone. And the film I always point to for that is a film that I always waver back and forth on, uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Uh, I, I do have an honorable mention, and that is Shinichiro Watanabe, who directed Cowboy Bebop. Just the way that Cowboy Bebop's story is told through visuals and supported by music basically being their own character is absolutely breathtaking. If you haven't seen Cowboy Bebop, definitely recommend. You have a new original web series out called Real Life. Real spelled R-E-E-L for good measure. You, right. released your, you released your first episode in November. Well done. You must Thank be very you. proud. I am. I, I really am. You deserve to be. It's good. What is the series about? And what two or three things inspired you to create it? Real Life is about a 20-something filmmaker named James Green, who seems to have finally made it. He's finally achieved his dream. dream. He's a filmmaker living in Los Angeles. He's got several features under his belt, but uh, he's made some not so great career decisions since moving out to Los Angeles. And as a result, his reputation is basically in the toilet and he's trying to rebuild his career from the ashes that it currently lies in while at the same time grappling with feelings of self-doubt and an inferiority complex uh, when he views himself in comparison to two women he went to high school with who are finding um, continued success in the, in, the, uh, in the film industry in the same amount of time. And as far as three things that inspired it, the first was my own experiences and people I've known uh, and emotions that I've felt. Uh, the two uh, people that James feels inferior to in the show uh, the characters of Serena Matthews and Jennifer Davis are inspired, albeit a bit loosely, by two uh, by two girls I went to high school with, and one of them I went to college with. They're they're doing very well for themselves, and uh, I'm not at the same place they are. Not even close. They've gone further along in their careers than I have, so I, I draw on that feeling as the the main cr the main thrust. Of, of real life. So it really is the, the emotions and the people I've met and my own personal experiences. But as far as other works, uh, there are two in particular that come to mind. One of them is uh, the Netflix original series, Bojack Horseman, which wrapped up this year, uh, as well as the Showtime original series, Californication, uh, which uh, wrapped up in 2014 and I just bought the DVD box set so, and I'm watching through that again because it puts me in a really creative mood. That's kind of why I was able to finish that script I mentioned earlier today. Well, well done for finishing the script. It sounds like you're working incredibly hard on it, which, which is always a good thing. And also I want to stress that you're using your feelings and your experiences really constructively and you will get to the place you want to. You're just not quite there yet but the stress is on yet. Thank you. How did you find the voice actors who play their roles in the series? And what were you looking for? I.e., what was the casting call like? So the pilot just came out in November, 2020. Casting started all the way back in October, 2016. Yeah, your eyes going wide. I mean, I don't, I don't blame you for being surprised at that because uh, I started casting way too early. Only about two or three voice actors from that initial round of casting are still on the project. I'm not gonna name who, I'm sure if someone were to do the research, they could find out. Uh, and because I, I don't mean to disparage anyone who had to drop out, everyone who's auditioned has been absolutely fantastic. It, it was a years long process. And I remember it was, I think it was 27, it was 2017, I believe, 2017, 2018 when I had to recast the lead, I had to recast for James. And that's when Tom Aglio auditioned. Uh, you, you interviewed him somewhat recently. It was a good interview. Um, and I thought, you know, he's got, he's got there, there's something about him, I wanna give him a shot. 
and I'm, I'm very happy that he's uh, committed to the project because Tom really uh, is the heart of the show. As far as uh, other characters, other cast members, I wasn't too, too particular with most of them. Uh, other than the character of Eddie, who I, I cast as my friend Tyler. And I basically just wrote Eddie as Tyler with a different name and a slightly different life. And it all worked out. Tyler is Eddie in all but name. Uh, as for a character that you'll see starting in the second episode, a character by the name of Cole Pierce. Uh, Cole Pierce is an African-American man. and the man I got to play Cole Pierce, thankfully, was a was an African American man. I get in the Discord call with him to do his lines, and I talk with him. And turns out he is an actor who has been working in Hollywood for the last twenty some odd years. He's been playing bit parts on several major television shows, uh, including uh, Law and Order, several big TV shows. The Mindy Project, I know, is one of them. Uh, it was an actor by the name of Jim Titus. He nailed the voice and tone for Cole that I was looking for, which uh, it, it's hard to really put that in perspective, considering that the character has not made an appearance yet on the show publicly. But I, I could not have asked for uh, better luck in casting really everybody in 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 their roles, it's in particular. DJ Horn is uh, Malcolm Conti, who um, only got one line as a character playing a character in the pilot. And I knew I have to bring him back. I have to bring him back. So he's going to be in episode two. And uh, I, I have a role for him later down the line as well, because he's just too good of an actor to waste. And I can go on and on about the contributions that every actor has made and how they've stuck with the project for at least uh, three years, most if not all of them. But I would be here all day just gushing and singing my praises about them all. The, the cast is absolutely fantastic. I couldn't ask for a better cast. Good, I'm really happy for you. You sound like Thank you've you. chosen well. What kind of videos slash productions haven't you made yet that you would like to make? I, I've been thinking about this one for a while I've been thinking about stuff that I want to do uh, other than just make machinima. And one of them is definitely video essays. Uh, in recent years, I've been watching video essays from people like Lindsay Ellis and Patrick Willems and breaking down something that uh, I love and explaining parts of it and maybe giving a new take or, or exploring it in a new way. It's something that is intimidating, but it's also fascinating. And part of that comes from one of my professors at UCF, who um, as, one day I asked him if he knew about the graphic novel, The Dark Knight Returns, uh, written, by, uh, written by Frank Miller back in the 1980s. It was a deconstruction of Batman. Uh, to put it mildly. And he said, no, what is it about? And I was telling him about it. And I was breaking down a lot of uh, the ways that it kind of examines Batman and it's like bare in his uh, very bare parts in terms of how the character works. And he asked me, have you ever considered teaching? Uh, and the reason he said that was because the way that I was describing this stuff to him um, was very engaging to him. So that combined with my love for the format of the video essay, I, I wanna try my hand at it. It's just a matter of doing the research on a topic as well as taking the time to write something comprehensive. Um, but I'm thinking that if I'm gonna do it, I'm going to uh, start a new channel as a clean slate for this kind of content. And one of the first things I would want to do is a video essay on Californication. Uh, again, show I love I'm watching it again right now. 
uh, and like kind of breaking down like why why pe why don't people talk about this one? Like people still talk about weeds. They still call talk about Dexter. They still talk about Chuck, Breaking Bad. Some people still talk about Entourage. Californication is just kind of left in the dust. And wh why is that? So um, I've been and also I kind of want to address the idea that the show is sexist or misogynist, which I think I think it's a there's a bit more than just a straight yes or no answer there. I think there's a bit more to unpack. Uh, but uh, spoiler alert. Yeah, it is a little bit sexist, but just just a little bit. But that's mainly in how it presents some of its subjects, not so much not so much the actual content, but, uh, but yeah, video essays is one. And then another, uh, I'm a huge fan of Doctor Who and I'm a huge fan of the audio plays of Doctor Who produced by Big Finish Productions. And I have thought about at times maybe doing a fan audio production of Doctor Who. Uh, using, you know, pre-established characters, but using it kind of like as, you know, kind of a spec, not with the expectation that I'd be picked up to write some official stuff, but mainly as fun and to try my hand at something new. Um, and I've seen a lot of fan audios here and there, and they, 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 they do interesting things. So that, that's, that's something I, I want to do for fun is, is a Doctor Who. Cool. Well, I really hope you do your video essays and you do your, you know, the fun stuff for Doctor Who as well. So do I. If you could go back in time and speak with your younger self, what advice would you give him about the animation creating process? Take your time, seriously. Like, it's not a race. YouTube's still going to be there. And no matter what, nobody's still going to watch it. <laughs> I, I, I kid about that last <laughs> part. But, and, and, and second, like, be mindful of where you place the camera because... You know, like, you know about the 180 degree rule, rule. Don't shirk it because you're just trying to rush through this. For God's sakes, you're going to regret it. In your opinion, what is the most rewarding part of creating content slash animation? Just people watching and enjoying it is probably the most rewarding thing. Because no, knowing that, you know, this is something that I put blood, sweat and tears into has you know, brought people some enjoyment, even for only 25 minutes. Um, it's, it's huge to me. That's like, oh, wow, something I made has brightened up someone's day and they've gotten something out of it. You've spoken about the most rewarding part, but now let's move on to the hardest part. So what oh, is boy. the hardest part of creating animation for you? It is very easily the pre-production stage. And there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, first off, there's nailing down the script. Um, the pilot for real life, which I mentioned earlier, uh, had its first drafts in 2015. By the time it was finished, it was on its 19th draft. And it's fourth or fifth major edit in Premiere. But that's post-production. Uh, so it's a matter of, you know, figuring things out on the conceptual level, what works, what doesn't, what what makes for a good story, like deciding what the story is, how it plays out, why the why these decisions are being made. That takes a lot of time because season one of Real Life was supposed to originally be five episodes. Now it's going to be eight episodes because I was really in the groove when writing a, some draft of episode two and I realized, wow, I really want to explore this. And then I realized later, oh, this actually fleshes things out. This actually gives more time with our characters so that stuff that happens later just doesn't seem to come way too fast. Outside of video creating, what do you like to do in your spare time? Uh, video games is, uh, is one of the big ones. Um, the big thing right now is I play Pokemon competitively on my Switch. And I've been in and out of that over the last year because the meta's the meta has been changing every couple months or so with new rule sets to keep things fresh. And I, I just picked it back up again, and I got to uh, the master ball rank on the on the ranked ladder. And I, I've been having I've been having a good time with it. I like trying to team build. I like going onto the VGC subreddit to theory craft and 
running calculations and taking notes and just having just monstrous amounts of data just to see, can I win a game with this team? And with that game's only gonna be like five minutes. Just so, so much number crunching. I'm not even a math guy, like, but Pokemon is just numbers. That's all it is. It's just numbers. Don't let anyone tell you different. I still love it, but it's just numbers. Um, but uh, again, watching video essays and engaging discuss in discussions about media and watching movies and listening to audio commentaries, uh, stuff that allows for creative expression and enables creative expression or inspires creative expression, I, I think is the best way to put that. Well, that sounds like you do a lot, you know, to make your work even better in your spare time, which is great. Yeah. It's a sign of a true creative. Thank you. Lastly, and I cannot believe we're on the last question already. Is there anything else you'd like to say that you haven't already in this interview? Uh, get your work, get your voice out there. Uh, I'm sure someone will enjoy it. And if anything, you will be all the better for having it out there. Idea that they want to put out into the world that they should do what they can to make their voice heard. Even if the presentation isn't super flashy, even if it's not well edited, uh, even if you don't have a large platform, you don't have a lot of subscribers or followers or whatever, get your message out there, get your point across. And if you feel like you have to have these skills to make it more palatable, then, well, first, you don't need the skills as long as you work on your presentation as you and know uh, your idea inside and out. But there are tools to get better, both uh, free and paid, you know. Take your time to really uh, to really polish what you want to say and how you're going to say it uh, so that your message comes across and it's in the way that you intend and you make your make you make yourself heard i i understand i i uh kind of <laughs> I kind of jumbled that up a little bit, but but the, the point is uh, get your work, get your voice out there. Uh, I'm sure someone will enjoy it. And if anything, you will be all the better for having it out there. And that's all I have for you today, guys. Thank you for watching. And I really hope you have enjoyed this interview with the writer, video content creator, and YouTuber, Andrew Bluett. Like, comment and hit that subscribe button and tell me, what did you think of the interview? Do you agree that Andrew is deeply passionate about video content creating and very knowledgeable? In the description below, I have left links to Andrew's website and to his YouTube channel. If you enjoy watching Machinima and enjoy GTA, then check out Andrew's original web series, Real Life Now. Moreover, my debut fantasy novella, The Sultan's Daughter, is out. If you are looking for a book that is short, fast-paced and full of suspense, then check it out. I have left a link for the book in the description below as well. Otherwise, until next time, keep well. Once again, guys, I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching my video. I really appreciate it and I hope you've enjoyed it. Hit that subscribe button and then you will be the first to receive more awesome content from my channel. And I hope to see you again soon.